working mm -hmm. topic in terms of encyclopedia. My knowledge is very limited to only to economics. I'm not a philosopher by any definition. I'm not even a Brahmin. But you're a Boston Brahmin now. Yeah, yes. <laughs> I'm, a Boston, I'm a Boston Brahmin, of course. But here, I'm still a Jack from Haryana. <laughs> ago, I was just checking my, I have about a thousand books, maybe more. I love books. My wife always complains that she has a rival. But one day I was arranging them and I had two copies of her chapter. And I thought, let me give one to Professor Samuelson. I had taken his course on the history of the Fleming thought. So I went to MIT to give him the book. And it was around 6 o'clock. Everybody had left. His secretary also had left. So I could walk up to him. Otherwise, he would not let me. And handed over the copy to him. And he just glanced over. And I asked a question. Does it have opportunity cost? A person who doesn't know opportunity cost is not an economist. Opportunity cost means when you are here, what else you could have done? What you are giving up to be here? That's opportunity cost. I had really not read it. I had just also glanced over with pages are cut. So I couldn't answer. So I was so embarrassed I could hardly reach home. And I read it and I said, wow. I couldn't imagine what this has. All the modern concepts, most of the modern concepts, important concepts, are in the book. So I read it again, just to make sure. And then I wrote a paper. Totally non-technical, no quotation from our saucer, just giving my ideas. And sent it for publication, nobody will accept it. I tried everywhere. I was so disappointed that this is such a wonderful book. People should receive it, appreciate it, but uh, no luck. Now, after two years or so, the Buddha moment, enlightenment, I teach Adam Smith, I teach Ricardo, another classical economist, and they had absolutely no idea about equations or graphs. But gee, if they can use for Adam Smith equation and graphs, why can't I use what I do? I'm for Petralia. I was in business. In one year, I wrote a book and submitted that to Oxford University Press. And Professor Bhagwati, he was my super, teacher supervisor at MIT, he wrote a very nice letter that this should be published. And they were ready to publish, but then they said that there is a requirement that we have to send it to a referee. No, okay. And the referee was a fan of Adam Smith. So he wrote back that first you have to change the title, that he was not the first economist. And how could he be the founder of, founder of economics? He was not even an economist. And the second thing he said, that you can say Kotele was great, but you have to say Adam Smith was greater. Well, I'm not used to telling lies. Sorry. So I withdrew the book. And then my wife, you know, she's really smart. I'm stubborn, but she's smart. <laughs> so she said that you are giving a heavy dose that Kutala innovated so many concepts. How anybody is going to accept that? Now what do I do? She said, it's like a medicine. Give it smaller, smaller doses. OK. So I took two, three ideas and published a paper. Took another two, three ideas, published a paper. So that way, I published 20 papers. And then people even asked, uh, could you contribute to my journal? So I have plenty of papers. And then there was a time to put them together into the book. So that was my first book in 2014, Cordelia, uh, The True Founder of Economics. And actually, if you look at the book, and if you have an access to the book, 
it is technical because I wanted to prove that not just a statement as you are a philosopher, a claim is only as good as the argument it depends on. So I wanted to justify that. Why Kotelia should replace Adam Smith? So there, there are many things which, that why Adam Smith was the father of economics, that he was the first one to write a book. Well, Kotelia wrote 2000 earlier. And then there are other things that he put together the economic concepts. Well, Kotelia did even much more uh, comprehensive, consistent, concise. Adam Smith's book is very inconsistent. So all those arguments which have been proposed why could, uh, Adam Smith was considered the father of economics, but well, Kotelia satisfied even more than that. So that was chapter three. So the first five chapters basically are that Kotelia should be the father of economics. Then what else? Chapter six, if you don't read anything in that book, please do read chapter six. That's really how you can connect Kotelia the earth Shaster to the Vedic culture. He was a Vedic man. A uh, lot of people criticize that he was too materialistic, but that's not correct. He was very, very ethical. He was not religious, but he was very ethical. But there are certain things. Uh, if some foreign aggression, then the first thing you would say that the temples have a lot of gold, take it out and use it to finance the army. And that's why people call him, call him immoral and all that. But he was very ethical, and this is what I'm going to prove in this uh, today. So this is the topic of my talk. And this brief outline that how particularly what he got from the Gita. That's just amazing. Uh, somebody was saying yesterday, uh, after that, there are 11 interpretations of Gita. Uh, I'm not calling full in interpretation, but maybe a little bit uh, more than what others have done. So he was called an Acharya, and very far-sighted, foresighted, very secular, and kingmaker. But uh, my work starts from a lot of serials you might have seen on the TV, that how uh, Kotelia in installed Chandragupta Maurya on the throne, and that's the end of it. My book starts after that, that how did he go on? That's all in my book. I start from there. Look at the concept he contributed at that time. These are all important concepts in, uh, in economics, and particularly that opportunity cost. Uh, it was not too long ago that it was introduced in economics, and there are many, many other concepts which have been uh, that are contained in the Arthasastra. But this is more important. There are particularly here, at least he could have gotten four Nobel Prizes. Uh, this crime and punishment, uh, Professor Packard, he got a Nobel Prize, and Kotelia has more insight than what Packard had, and he got a Nobel Prize for that. Kotelia would have definitely got a Nobel Prize on that. And then this return trade-off, Markovich, he got a Nobel Prize. Kotelia has fully developed uh, uh, portfolio theory, basically, that it is not just the expected return, but the risk is equally important. So he is fully developed. And then asymmetric information. That's Professor Arkanov, he got Nobel Prize for that. And Kotelia had even more details than, that, than him. So he would have got a Nobel Prize. And this last one, time inconsistency problem, that's also uh, Prescott and Keelan, they got Nobel Prize. Kotelia has detail, and this is one of my chapters in my book, chapter uh, 20th. 
So at least he would have gotten four Nobel Prizes. Now, what is wrong with the Western economics? Uh, it may not be this much science, but it has definitely become a moral science. There's absolutely no ethics in that. Every consumer, investor, producer, just name it, bureaucrat, politician, is assumed to be a utility maximizer, just serving his own interest, nothing more than that. And the sole reliance on contracts has crowded out the conscience-based commitments. If it is not in the contract, you know, you're out of luck. And so on. So it, uh, there's a trust deficit, and there's a concern of suspicion. Most of the American uh, dealings in business, they start with the assumption that whatever you are signing, the other party is not going to follow that. So make sure that the cost of breaking the law will be, or the contract will be higher than, than keeping it. They focus on that. And they hire so many <laughs> lawyers and others to make sure that it is implemented. And of course, this, your fiduciary duty has replaced the moral duty. This is the state of affairs of the Western economics. Now this is sources of Cotillion surplus. That if we apply Cotillion's economics, then all these people, there will be no need for supervisors. People will not do emails in their office time, or make calls, or do anything else. They will just focus on their work. So there will be no need for supervisors. Corporate board of directors, why they are there to supervise management? If management is ethical, why do you need so them? So that will be abolished. Doctors will not do any unnecessary operations or prescribe opiates unnecessarily. Bank managers will not take excessive risk because it's not their money. They invest it in wrong ways and even cause a crisis. And similarly, stockbrokers. They will focus on the clients, not anywhere else. No need to write any lengthy contracts. Drug companies will not push harmful medicine. Every time you open the television, they are advertising something. And public servants, they will just formulate and implement sound economic policies. And currently, the world GDP is around $75 trillion. At least you can save 10%. So, so you can save at least $7 trillion if Cotillia's economics is applied. And what is more interesting, that if you apply that, what happens? A lot of people, they will lose jobs. Because all those manipulators in between, they are not needed. But these are very productive people. Think of Mayavati or Lalu Prashad. They can fool so many people. They are genius. If they use their energies in productive activities, they could be big innovators. So the GDP, not only you save the cost, but on the other side, they will contribute real GDP, not just uh, zeros from game that you basically uh, grow at the expense of someone else. Now this is Aristotle. We will talk about him a lot, but what did he define? Nothing. Very imprecise. This is like saying, where is your house? In front, of the, in front of the temple. And where is the temple? In front of my house. Circular. But our Vedic uh, values are forever, and they are eternal, there is no circularity. And more. And this is what they are saying. I'm not making that up. And uh, here, that is uh, just uh, remedial, nothing else. And what we have instead, the foundational role of ethics. So our ancient thinkers, they were creating heaven on earth because they said if you follow this, 
uh, virtues and give up all those vices, you are creating heaven on earth. So basically, our ancient sages, they were saying that unless you create heaven on earth, you cannot go to heaven. So indirectly, that concept of harmony and peace, they were here creating, trying to create that. So all these uh, vices, anger, uh, lust, all those are destructive things. So unless you control them, you cannot create heaven here on earth. So the concept of heaven on earth, that was for the uneducated, that was to motivate them to be good, uh, perform good deeds. Uh, this is what um, I, because in economics we use a lot of graphs. So on the horizontal axis, moral capital. That every, in every life you keep adding good deeds to your uh, capital, moral capital. And if you want to reach bliss, keep doing that. They will never tell that how much moral capital you should have. They are very smart. Then you will never know whether you have done enough. Just keep doing. And if you uh, don't do good deeds, you go backward. And Kautilya basically followed the Artha Veda uh, both in Latin and Spirit. If there is no dharma, there is no society. So for when a dharma overwhelms a dharma, even the king, he will be gone, he will be destroyed. And he keeps repeating the same passage over and over, not at just one place. Uh, the wealth is like a tree. It's yours should be dharma, and of course the fruits is GDP, the income. So always uh, emphasizing the foundational role of the ethics of dharma. Should I keep going? Okay. For the world, when maintained in accordance with the Vedas will prosper and not perish. Repeatedly he gave the same message over and over. So he was very ethical. And now I'll connect Gita to the Arshastra. Uh, Britishers, they gave the 4th century BC, but I strongly believe that he was much earlier than that, much earlier. Because some of the measurements he uses in our chapter, those are the Harappa culture which flourished 2600 BC. So he uses the same kind of measurements and he was heavily influenced by the Gita. So that means he cannot be too far away from that period. So this 4th century period is an artificial date. Nobody really knows that. I think he was much earlier than that. This is what Gita says. This is the only shlok, I mean, I will go. Yeah, this is what he says when the evildoers, they are spreading evil, evil things, then he comes over and over, yuga yuga, basically, to destroy that, that concept yuga yuga, that whenever a dharma is spread, then he manifests himself and destroy that and reestablish uh, righteousness. Now, Kautilya, because this is like a cycle, that a dharma spreads, becomes destroyed a dharma, and then again a dharma starts, and then he comes again, over and over. So it's a kind of cycle. I think that bothered Kautilya too much. Why? There are at least three things which were uh, bothering uh, Chanakya. That Atharsha manifested only when Atharma had reached its peaks. And that Athar manifested, and there was a lot of collateral damage. There were Chari, Vishnu so many people were lost. And similarly, Raman, uh, he was a great scholar. Uh, too bad he 
suffered from other uh, maladies, but otherwise he was a scholar, so there was a lot of collateral damage. So sure, a car came and destroyed evil, but in the process he destroyed a lot of other good things also. So that also bothered him. And in the meantime, a lot of social fabric, that was also ruined. So how to stop that whole process for good? That was his main, main idea. I've been struggling with this part for the last several years because there are so many people who think Gita is sacred and how can you say that something Gurta Avatar does that Gurta uh, wants to do better than that. So I was very reluctant to introduce, keep this, but today I have the courage uh, with a lot of blessings. Uh, let me really say why Gurta Avatar Sastra. And that is clear from the next slide. <clears throat> this is the last uh, shloka in our Shastra. After he has written, usually people write in the beginning, but he writes after that. That he has written it basically to promote dharma first and then artha. That's very important, the sequence. First uh, dharma and then artha and of course uh, aesthetic pleasures and destroying the opposites of that so that avatar doesn't have to manifest again and again. So that was his primary goal. There are a lot of other connections to the Gita. Lord Krishna says, desire, anger, and greed. This triple gate of hell brings about the ruination of the soul. They are talking about still the spiritual good. Now what Kutile says, sure, if you display all those uh, vices, greed, anger, and so on, you go to hell. But Kutila was more concerned about this life here. That look at the empirical evidence he provides. That all these kings, they suffer from those vices. So he extended the list also, not just lust, anger, and greed, but also conceit and other foolhardiness and so on. That they are also equally dangerous. And he gives the empirical evidence that how life here on earth also is ruined if you display those. Now I'll come back to that also later on. Rama Lincoln, he was the chairman of the computer company, Satyam or Satyam, and he was cooking the books and finally he was caught. And what was his statement? That when you are riding a tiger, you don't know how to get off. It seems like that it makes sense, but it makes no sense. Because greed clouds the mind. You can't process information. You can't see the consequences. It overpowers you. So you couldn't see that if you ride the tiger, you cannot get off. So why you start to begin with? Why ride it? Kotenda, this is another aspect of Kotenda's insights. Usually we say, we feel Kali, and he is showing all that. So he had a really real insight into the actual life and how to improve. So he extended the list of the Gita and extended it to the current life here, life on earth. So he did not discard Gita, he accepted that. Only thing he complimented and supplemented that. That was the important part. He never criticized any religious thing, never. And then he summarizes his findings, the consequences of vice, that all these and others now another thing from the previous one, let me go back. 
Listen here, he mentioned Raman and Duryodhan. So these are not fairy tales, these are actual facts. Because this RSS is now saying all those things, but he was not a member of RSS. He was 2500 years ago. And he's saying to Raman and Duryodhan that they were real people. So that means Mahabharata and Ramayana, those are real things, not just fabrications. And why they basically were destroyed? Because they were conceded. They thought nobody could defeat them. And this is another paper I have written. Uh, Lord Krishna offered a choice to Duryodhan that you want me or you want my army. And he was so stupid, he said that I want your army. He never appreciated the value of a good advisor. If he had taken the Lord Krishna, he would have definitely uh, defeated them. Uh, so, uh, there's a whole paper I've written on that, that how Kautilya benefited from these kind of things from the Mahabharata. That's a separate paper. Now, this is basically the crux of the things. Look at that. There are four possibilities in public interest against public interest, private interest against private interest. So the first problem is really no problem. There is no conflict between private interest and public interest. Absolutely no conflict. The second and the top on the right side, there is a conflict. Conflict of interest. Now on the bottom, where it is in public interest but against private interest, you can give them incentives. Kotila talks about giving a lot of incentives to private individuals to be charitable. And even now our government gives tax benefits that if you donate, then you can deduct that. And also, you motivate with moral duty that to serve the motherland, it's a good idea, it's your duty. So that's in the uh, first column, bottom uh, cell. And the top, the first row, that's the conflict of interest like lobbying. It's against the public interest, because that is just a zero-sum game. You are gaining at the expense of someone else, and that you can control with law. But this fourth and last one, that is against public interest and against private interest, almost all the economists, they can't handle that. That's where the lust, the green, greed, all those vices come in. That it is against public interest, private interest, why should people do it? As we mentioned, that when there is greed or lust or anger, you lose your mind, your mind gets clouded, you can't see the consequences. And you commit them, and by the time you have done it, it is too late, you cannot reverse it. So all those things, like they talk about justice, why there is injustice? because people are unethical. You cannot do that by law. Now, my second book, which just came out, I have only one copy and I just borrowed it. I borrowed it from my sister. Yeah. So this just came out, and the first chapter is an ounce of ethics is better than a ton of laws. All those in the fourth column, uh, you can include their slavery, subjugation, humiliation, rape, murder, all those the fourth column, because why people commit? Either they're angry or uh, lust or greed or considered, all those things, they lead to all those vices they commit, all those crimes. And our government is not understanding this concept. They are trying to pass more laws. Laws will never work. They will fail miserably. If law worked, why there are so many crimes in the United States? Every other day there's a murder, some, somebody killing people, many of them. Why? They have a lot of laws, because there's no ethics. Unless you teach ethics, those things are not going to go away. So our government should learn something from our uh, ancient thinking, that 
ethics is the key to everything. So that by chapter first, the whole theme of the book is that an ounce of ethics is better than a ton of laws. First of all, people don't realize that if people are not ethical, if our government is not ethical, if our legislators are not ethical, what kind of law they will pass? There will be a lot of vested interests who will be basically indirectly uh, manipulating the politicians, paying them off, and so on. So unless the politicians are ethical, we can't go too far. And uh, that's one of the things. When we say Sabka Vikas, Sabka Arthik Vikas, I will talk about that later on, how you get that part. Yeah, this is what Kutilya said, green colors of mine. That they can process it, that's what they will use anything. Now, in Kutilya's time, there were no Swiss banks. And still, if people are greedy, they were doing all those kind of things, manipulation, cooking the books, and so on. the only shlok in Gita. Now, those who are religious minded, they give a different kind of interpretation. I have given those also. But this time, they say it's the body. No. Uh, and economists look at this in a different way. That the success depends of any project depends on five factors. What are the initial conditions? The doer, the worker, what are his qualifications? And so on. Choice of different techniques. That's very important. If you want to go to the moon, you cannot just go on a bike. There got to be a different kind of board to a rocket or something to go to the moon. Cycle for the ninja So the choice of techniques and then many zero efforts. And of course, the final is unknown factors which you call day one. So these are five factors. This is the only shlok in the whole Gita where there is some economics, real economics, uh, for success of a project. Now Kotila took it, but he gave a very different, meaningful, up-to-date, modern interpretation of this shloka. He extended that. He divided those factors into two groups, which are under the control of human being like managerial skills, efforts, and the choice of techniques, those are under the control of the human, and they whom which are not. So this is nowadays called analysis of variance in statistics, that you're separating the total variation into explained and unexplained. Now this concept did not come until 1920s. It was 2400 years earlier, he was that far sighted. Because how you appraise the project? If you can't do this kind of analysis, that something happened because of good luck, or because of bad luck, or because of human effort. If you can't separate those, how are you going to judge the policy? So I have written a full paper on that. Uh, that's not in the book, I just forgot to include that. Now what I have done, this is what Kotilya said, this is what I did, separating them into two components, making it a regression equation. And it satisfies all the assumptions of a regression equation, because they um, that's totally random, you can't control it, and the explained part, XP. This is econometrics. So he did not discard Gita, he extended that, supplemented that. Because one of the claims some Western make that he must have learned from, uh, because Alexander came and that there was a student of uh, Aristotle, so he met Alexander, he must have, in few minutes he was, must have learned everything 
what the historical said. Well, he follows the Indian tradition, Indian thought. So that was another motivation for me to say that everything is connected to the Indian thing. Unless you go back to the Vedic culture, you cannot understand Kutilaya. And you have to read the whole of the book, not just a few pages here and there. That's the thing. Now this is what Lord Krishna, he uh, makes, guarantees, gives assurance that he will take care of them, whatever they have, he will preserve that, and whatever they don't have, he will fulfill that. You have shame. Now Kutilla took this concept, but what he did, because again he did not reject that. He said, how about having a Raja Rishi, a king, wise, and ethical, like a sage. Raja Rishi as a Jnana Yogi. Now, in Gita, the Jnana Yogi basically is a Sankha Yogi, which is a part of philosophy at that time also, and Kutilda also uses in the same sense. But Gyan Yogi is a lot broader than a Sankhya Yogi. Because not only should we know philosophy, but also economic political science. Then he is a real Gyan Yogi. Three things. Uh, philosophy, the Sankhya Yogi, plus economics, plus political science. Then he will be a Gyan Yogi. So this is one component to be a Rajarishi. And see why he needs philosophy? Because you learn that from philosophy that whether it's a good time or a bad time, you are stable. That's very important for a king that not to be affected by if there's sometimes maybe famine or an attack or whatever, all kind of calamities. So you should be the same throughout and not be too excited if there is success or something. So this he learns from philosophy. He should be consistent, coherent, and of course, stable. Santulam mm -hmm. is very important, the balance. And of course, logic. He was very logical. He outlines that how you get uh, Yogshim. Father Rajarishi is going to get the Yogshim. So he first identifies what are the sources of prosperity? There should be more land under cultivation, it should be irrigated. Secondly, there should be more water projects, more roads, building uh, townships with their markets, connect, connect the countries everywhere. And third, of course, uh, the manpower. The value of land is what man, man makes of it. That's one of the famous lines. So he identifies those. And interestingly, I'm not elaborating here, but the, all those paragraphs in the Earth Sasser, they are also in Wealth of Nations, exactly the same. So Adam says, borrow from there. He copied without acknowledging. That's one of my papers. Um, Chapter 3 challenges that why Adam Smith, in my first book, why Adam Smith should be replaced with Kotila's thinking. I gave that to a professor, very liberal, and he didn't like that at all. He wrote a very nasty letter to me, that how dare you can say that Kotila was the father of economics, oh sorry, founder of economics, ladies don't like father, the word father, so they like founder. So I started thinking that is it possible that Adam Smith borrowed from Dar's Sastra? I had no clue. But then I started looking, I had read, read Adam Smith, that's all I had done in my life. And then I started connecting them and wrote a paper. So this, all these things are in Dar's Sastra and uh, Adam Smith borrows from there. So I put them side by side, compare. And then there are on taxation, principles of taxation. Whatever Kapila had, the, the tax rate should be as low as possible. 
there is Shirdi economy in collecting the taxes and so on. And Adam Smith precisely the same thing has in, our, in his uh, wealth of nations. And then a thief always leaves some imprints, some evidence. And that's where you can really catch him, catch Adam Smith. In economics, there is a concept called uh, distortion, or we call in economics deadweight loss. That when you put a tax, people try to avoid it. If you put a toll tax, they will find some other way. We call that distortion or deadweight loss. Adam Smith didn't know it, Kutala didn't know it. So Adam uh, criticizes monopolies, why they are bad, why they are undesirable. So Kutala said they oppress the people because they charge high price and so on. You know, he actually says that. And Adam Smith uses the same word that they oppress. That's how you can really confirm that Adam Smith had access to Kutala. So I published that paper, it has been downloaded at least 10,000 times. One of the most popular papers. And there's not a single country on earth where uh, my articles are not raised. Every week I get a list, and they are everywhere, in every country. So he could only really outline these five steps. And finally, on the fourth step, uh, let me go one by one, uh, not rush. So after he identifies, land, manpower, and we call capital like uh, building roads, infrastructure. So how do you promote them? If you want a private person to invest, like in water projects or in whatever they want to invest in, the rate of return should be high and the rate should be low. So identify those factors. That if the rate of return is high and risk is lower, people invest more. All right? So that's the second link. Then the third link, very sequence. This is called backward induction. The third link, that how you reduce risk. There should be law and order. Like in Afghanistan and Iraq, you are not sure. You work all day and someone comes with a gun in the, at night and takes away everything. Why would you work? Why would you go to school? Why would you save anything? So you have to have law and order. That's one of the things. A lot of other things. He, there was no private insurance at the, at the time, so he provided insurance. If there's a fire or theft or whatever, there will be insurance. Government will, will take care of that part. So he reduced the risk. How about the rate of return? If there are no roads, there's no market. So he built a lot of infrastructure setting up new markets. So he connected everything, all the villages to the cities and so on. So, and of course, give, give a lot of incentives that if you bring more land under cultivation, uh, this is yours. You, have, you don't have to pay a land tax for many, many years and so on. A lot of taxes, uh, concessional loans at a lower rate and so on. That was the concept at that time. And I know my time, uh, please give me a couple of more. I'm still, I have a lot of time. In 1971, yeah, I was in Government of India, Ministry of Finance. I was in Indian Economic Service in the first batch. And I wrote an article, a small piece, and it was published in Economic Times right away. And what was the article saying? At that time, the bank rate was 16, 17%. And if a young person graduates, have an engineering degree, but that's all he has. He has no balance, bank balance, he has no balance sheet, nothing. All he has is mind and his degree. He cannot afford 16, 17% interest rate, and nobody, no bank will give him. So I wrote a paper that the government should subsidize and give no more than 6% rate of interest. That was the highest rate they should charge on a graduate, engineers, or whoever wants to set up a business. And my advisor called me right away, that who gave you permission to write it? That you have to take clearance. Well, I'm sorry, but this makes common sense, that you've got to lower the interest rate if you really want to promote. 
And that's what I was fighting against uh, Rajanath, the uh, ex uh, governor. He was a bad fit for the country. But anyway, let's not make it political. So Kotila at that time, he talks about giving us national rights. And after all that, now, who's going to implement all that? The politicians. And if they are not ethical, everything will collapse. That's where the ethics comes in. And that, that's the role of the Rajasthi, to have sound policies which are good for everybody, the common good, not just for personal good. So unless you have a Rajarishi, someone who is basically working for the public, not for himself, all those other things will fail. So that's the fourth link. But how to make a Rajarishi? It doesn't stop at one point. It goes all the way. And that's where this link five Ethical anchoring is the only way to ensure a ruler will be a Raja Rishi. So he's our sasar. He talks about everything, but how does he start? The very first chapter, he talks about the need for philosophy. The very first chapter. There are 150 chapters in the book. The first chapter is only just basically giving the contents. The real chapter is second, chapter second, which should be chapter one. And there he talks about necessity of philosophy. And that's where he starts, and I'll bring a couple of slides on that. And then he talks about the Dhanasasras, that he should be not just a Rajar, I mean, a Rajarishi not only should be a Jnana Yogi, but also he should be a Karam Yogi. And unless he has a sound ethical background, he will not be a Karam Yogi. So Rajarishi should be a Jnana Yogi and plus a Karam Yogi. Only then he will be called a Rajarishi. So this chapter 5, I mean the length 5, he starts the book from there. So he does this backward induction, but finally he starts that this is the most important thing, the step five. If people are not ethical, uh, everything will collapse. So this is those five steps and those basically factors, you know, I, I don't want to bother you with that. All right? The sources of economic prosperity, how he identifies all those land, manpower, and so on. Uh, let me skip all that. That's, uh, I don't want to make it too technical. So the Rajarishi, he should know philosophy, and he also must know economic management. And as the king shall be ever active in the management of the economy, the rule of wealth is economic activity, and lack of it brings natural, I mean material distress. In the absence of fruitful economic activity, what do you mean by fruitful? Having infrastructure, not constructing all those uh, elephants and those kind of things in India you might have seen. That's just a waste of money. And also not palaces. He did not recommend any palace for the king. Sure, security, but no palace or a luxurious life for the king. A king is a Raja Rishi. He should live like a Rishi. No luxuries, just a bare minimum. So he should spend, almost 75% of the budget was spent on infrastructure. And today infrastructure means uh, providing all those Wi-Fi everywhere, and roads, and so on. And it should be foresighted. And that, of course, he learns from the philosophy. He should identify all the threats to the economy or the, to the country, aggression. That was one of the biggest threats at the time. So national security, very important. You do all the work and someone comes and invade and take away everything and destroy your culture. So that's very important as security, very important. Floods, famines. He, at that time, he talked about for stocks. 
at that time. And I'm sorry to say, for sake of sin, he got everything from here. And he's not even acknowledged, just in one foot note, small foot note, he gives him credit. That is really bad. That is intellectual dishonesty. And also, the third factor, moral decay, prevent moral decay. If morality goes, everything will be destroyed. He emphasizes that time and time again, that if the society or the king and the rulers, if they are not ethical, the uh, economy will collapse. So it is both internal threats and the external threats. Like right now, people are saying in, uh, in about 30, 40 years, all the snow that Himalayas will melt. So now there will be floods, and later on there will be dryness. We should worry about today. Foresighted means a problem in the distant future, you take action now. Farsighted means what you do today, your food will be tomorrow. That's farsighted. So you are both farsighted as well as foresighted. And this is a con that's why that unless the Rajarishi is there, is ethical, uh, nothing will work out. So he gives the foundational role to ethics. Ethics is everything. Uh, there are some economies, they say institutions are uh, deep determinant, that they are the foundation. But institutions, they depend on the Rajarishi. If the king or the rulers are not ethical, institutions, who cares for them? There will no rule of law. So he gives that role, a foundational role, to ethics. So that's all the Vedic tradition. And this is the heart of it, that he has to be a karam yogi. There is a purpose, that is to bring yogshen to everybody. And it is a selfless act, true selflessness, and a purpose. That is the true meaning of a karam yogi. So this last line, Kutila expected a king to be a royal servant to his uh, loyal servant to his royal public. Uh, I'm, I'm really sorry to admit that I got this somewhere and I can't find the reference. I looked and looked and looked. I copied it from somewhere, so that's why it's in the commas. It's not my thinking. But from someone else, and I just forgot the source. Uh, so sorry, maybe someday I'll go back to all my notes and find the real source who wrote that. But that's a really very important line. And Kutila really wanted him to be a servant. He was a paid servant. A true karma yogi. Now this is the summary of what we have been saying. So there are four possibilities that the ruler, the king or whoever is in charge, is a Gyan Yogi or is an ignorant. That's one classification on the top. <coughs> on the left side, <coughs> sorry. She's not here, but I follow her instructions. <coughs> and on the left row, I'm column, <coughs> either the ruler is a karma yogi or not a karma yogi. He's usually maximizer. That's what we have nowadays, most of the economics. Now the first one, Kotala prefer that, that the progress will be, growth will be maximal and it will be equitable. <coughs> so next on the same row that the person is karmi yogi but ignorant. So it will be very mediocre GDP growth. On the first column again, 
but the bottom cell, that the person is a Gyan Yogi, knows economics and everything else, but is immoral or amoral. That's the most dangerous situation. Uh, Congress was in their column. They are good people. I mean, knowledge of people, but corrupt. And that's why the uh, finance minister, Sitamra, is facing that um, mistake. So that's bad for the economy. Now, I'm sorry to say it, BJP started on the right hand, like the chief minister of Haryana, totally ignorant, I have absolutely no clue about anything. But honest. Now that thing, now is, all his cabinet is not honest anymore. So they are back to like the Nanda king. Very corrupt. One of my friends, he applied for a job for vice chancellor and the BJP government asked him to pay 60 lakhs. Can you imagine that? So they are ignorant and also they are becoming corrupt. That's a sad situation. We should really think about it seriously and get out of it. Do something. So finally, how you make a Rajarishi? Now, Chanakya, he took Chandragupta Murya, he was a child, and he taught him and made him not just a king of a small place, but a samrat, an emperor. And he was a very generous, good king, knowledgeable, and of course Kutala was along with him to help him out. So there he is suggesting to learn, look at this line, philosophy is the lamp that illuminates all sciences. It's very, really high on philosophy, because philosophy gives you uh, not the Taragvida, that how you argument, make arguments, but much more than that, it gives you the balance in life, Santulan, that you are not affected by adversity, you are prosperity. You are stable, you, are, you ba keep that balance, Santulan, very important. So that comes from philosophy. So that's why he, that is a pillar which supports them. So, Philosophy at that time had a lot, lot bigger role than perhaps it is today, unfortunately. I wish I had read the Sattru when I was going to call it out. Knew that you can acquire wealth with that. 
But the second part, intellect depends on education. And actually has a line somewhere uh, that those parents who don't teach their children, they are their enemies. Kotila's statement. So education is the key to everything. So this uh, last line I've added, Sapka Vikas, Mastik Ke Vikas Bina Nihu Sapka. So unless we have developed the brains of the kids with good education, which includes ethics, uh, we cannot prosper forever, we cannot sustain prosperity. And equitable for everybody, Sapka. And Kutanda really goes strong on that wise study philosophy. And here he, he listened to Sankhya, Yoga, and Aesthetic. At that time, these were three branches of philosophy. That it makes a distinction between what is dharam and what is atharam in the study of Vedas and between material gain, how you got it. But he said, earned by good means or bad means, and so on. And this last line, because their minds are kept steady in adversity and prosperity, and they are made proficient in thought, speech, and action. So philosophy uh, is really key in developing the brain, making them foresighted, logical, and of course, steady. So this is the first chapter in the book of our Sastra, because Important things first. So the sequence is like that. And of course, study of economics. All these topics are in the Arsasta. Accounting. Oh, by the way, this is another thing. After I had written my first draft of the book, my friend said, this is how about accounting. Well, unless you know accounting, how you're deciding which, pro which project is profitable, which is not. So, go to let up the accounting. And what I'm finding now, I was looking at uh, our Sarvasati Sindhu civilization, the Rapa civilization. Interestingly, they knew accounting. They had decimal system at that time in the Rapa culture, decimal system and accounting. So I'm going to write a paper on that also. But in our Shastra, I have a paper. And that was actually my first paper. And it's uh, published in, in my book also, Chapter 5, but also in a accounting historian journal, one of the top, top journals in accounting. So all the tax law, international trade, how to control famines, and so on, they are in uh, the Arsenity. And the administration of justice. Now, Adam Smith writes a line that justice is the pillar on which the whole edifice rests. And people say, wow, 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 what an insight. I've written a paper on that. And Kotila said, basically, that how you build that, that pillar, that sure is a great thing to have a good pillar, but how you make it? Adam Smith does not have a single line on that. How you construct that pillar? But Kutala says, what is justice? That whether it's your own king's own son or an enemy, there should be three cardinal principles of justice. That it should be in proportion to the guilt. It should be certain and impartial. He outlines those three cardinal principles of justice. So he has a, uh, one third of the book on what nowadays we call uh, law and economics. But also he adds ethics, ethics, law and economics. Uh, law should be ethical and efficient. And that's the key in formulating. And unless you are a Rajarishi, you cannot do that. So some of my papers are very popular on admission justice. There are several papers on that I've written, and there are three chapters in my book also. And the third part, uh, national security. Uh, that's all this, our, uh, what 
call the raw research and analysis wing. He had all those. How you defend the country? Elaborate. I've given a couple of uh, papers on. There are three chapters in my book, but also I've given seminars on that also many times on national security. So Raja Rishi must know all these things: how to govern, how to keep the rule of law, how to promote economic activities, and so on. A lengthy list. And then, of course, the most important thing is the ethical anchoring of the children. Because whatever you teach them, they think it is true. It's factual. They're like a clean slate. Whatever you put on them, that's what will stick. So they should be taught right things, dharma and artha, and not what is adharma and so on. Ethical anchoring, vices are due to ignorance and indiscipline. And unlearned man doesn't know or perceive the injurious consequences of his vices and so on. So the sole aim of all branches of knowledge is to inculcate restraint over the senses. This is the basic difference between ethics. Ethics develops internal strength, internal restraint. Other things, they are social cons constraints. If nobody is watching, you will do it. But if you have internal restraints, then whether somebody is watching or not watching, you don't need supervisors. You do it because you are disciplined, you are ethical. And finally, I want to conclude with that Gandhi's maximum principle. What is this maximum principle? That you maximize the welfare and well-being of the lowest person in the country. That's a true, uh, I would say, ethical statement. And Rawls, uh, a professor at Harvard University, John Rawls, he wrote a whole book on this one. And too bad he did not acknowledge Gandhi's contribution. Gandhi, when he died, this was on his table in 1948, and God knows when he wrote it. He should have acknowledged that. It was already published in the 50s, and he wrote his book in 1971. Very unfair of him and not to acknowledge Gandhi's uh, maximum principle. And if you give me a couple of minutes, I can show you a couple of more slides that how advanced he was. Workers' rights. He's concerned about that. That if they don't like the work, they don't have to do it. And try to form unions. Okay, let's keep on going. I'm running out of my time. Look at national security. He identifies all the factors relevant. And he's talking about the relative power of one country against other countries, not the absolute. What other countries are doing? And here, the role of the advisors, how much equipment you have, how much manpower you have, and how you make them energetic, enthusiastic, pay them good salary. A lot of things he talks about national security. Uh, my job was just to formulate that so that people can quickly understand what he was talking in spaces after pages. Let me keep going. There are so many things he has done. Nowadays we talk about a uh, lot of research teams and so on. This is what he talks about at that time. This is just amazing. That how you can pull knowledge and information to get sound economic analysis. He's talking at that time. Way advanced, thousands of years earlier, he's talking about that. And this is uh, his predecessor who was writing. Such, such a lengthy discussion on this topic in our Shastra. So many other experts, he talks about them. 
and gives some credit, and then he gives his own synthesis. Yeah, this is what I was talking about, judicial fairness. A king who observes his duty of protecting his people justly and according to law will go to heaven. He could be a karma yogi and a jnana yogi. No, he has to also be a fair-minded Rajarishi. Only then he can think of going to heaven. And it is the power of punishment alone when exercised impartially in proportion to the guilt and irrespective of whether the person uh, punishes the, the king's son or an enemy. And that protects this world and the next, currently and the future. Just a couple of minutes. Caring administration, whenever danger uh, threatened, the king will protect like a father protects his children. Yeah, in Gita, God and Lord Krishna take responsibility for the poor and the destitute. Here, the Rajarishi must take care of them. So he's not substituting, he's complimenting. That is a responsibility of the Rajarishi also. Not just giving responsibility to the king. It's a very modern thing. In America, it happened in, only in 1946 that Congress passed a law that government should keep full employment. There was nothing before that. And he's talking 2,500 years ago. What happened? There's got to be one more. Okay. That, that, um, there were two other slides. One was about child labor pass laws to prevent child labor at that time. And the second equally important, sexual harassment. He's talking at that time to pass law about sexual harassment because particularly government was giving some work to widows. And he strictly says they cannot even look at the face of that lady because they are not giving any, uh, they are not obliging him. She's working and she should be respected paid, of course, accordingly. All right, so thank you so much. And I hope, uh, let me show my second work. I'm not selling it, OK? That's not my job. That's a publisher's job. So this just came out. This is a moral hazard. What is moral hazard? People get tenure, and they stop publishing. That's moral hazard. No kripakki hui, kaam karne ki kya zirut hai. Politicians get elected, forget it after that. They don't have to do anything. So moral hazard is very widespread. Or if your car is fully insured, no deductibles. Why would you lock it? That's a moral hazard. People don't do what they are normally do. This is serious for all over the world. He talks about that. And then of course how to take care of poverty. And systemic risk. Uh, I wrote a paper. Adam Smith wrote that a system is like a machine. How can it be a machine? The part of the machine, they keep repeating involuntarily. There's no action there of their own. So, Kutila said, you know, that those parts, they don't have any moralizer problem. They don't know how to cheat others. They just keep repeating. So they have a wrong understanding of the system. So Kotlinet divides the system in two parts. There are human beings and there are things. And that's how you can control the systemic risk. So this paper, I published it. And just a couple of days later, I got a response from someone who, who works for oversight in the United States to control systemic risk. And it has been downloaded many, many times. So he talks about, I talk more in this book about systemic work. Look, and also about Machiavelli. People keep comparing. I hope after reading this article, they will stop comparing Kotelia to Machiavelli. There are a lot of other things which after the first book, this was just published this year, earlier this year. And 
It's the only copy I have, and this also I borrowed from my sister. <laughs> so I have to give it back to her. <laughs> I promise her. We'll order it here. Not to worry. We'll order it for our library. <laughs> well, you have to request her. <laughs> no, 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 no. We will order some copies for oh, our library. Okay, okay. Not to worry. I'm That's very hard of hearing now. Okay. That is some intentional. This is one way to protect when my wife talks, you know, if you can't listen, then no action, reaction. <laughs> <laughs> I got really a wonderful wife. And we just celebrated our 50 years in Switzerland, actually, before I came here. And she has been taking care of the family and the finances. And I've been just giving the talks here and there and writing, whatever. She has been really uh, more than just a simple life. I'm very, really blessed. Uh, when I got married, before that, my father took care of me. And at the time of marriage, he gave my hand to my wife. Now it's your responsibility. And she has been doing very well. <laughs> And she is very generous. Uh, in my village, my mother was uneducated, and I wanted to make sure that every girl in the village has access to education. So she made extra money, and we spent about 70 lakhs, got the whole school built, 22 classrooms, library, everything modern, and recently we put a solar system also on the top. So it's working beautiful. And she made the money, and my older brother, the whole family, there were 40, 50 workmen that could cook food for them, made tea for them, and so on. And people give me credit for no reason. <laughs> because I did nothing uh, in building the school. Because my wife made the money, and my brother, he built it. Everything, he managed everything. So I'm a very lucky man, getting credit for no reason. <laughs> Thank you so much, and uh, I really enjoyed the hospitality and the, the nice environment. And really, India has a really good future. When I look at these kind of institutions, uh, India is on the way to be a superpower. Uh, thank you, Professor Siha. Uh, this morning, uh, we have uh, we have been witness to a new way of looking at Cotillia, a new vision uh, to read Cotillia, not only in terms of uh, reading Cotillia through an economist's eye, but also from a different perspective. So far, there have been two approaches to interpreting Cotillia. One has been the sovereignist approach. The sovereignist approach was uh, prompted by the British uh, Raj in India and the independent sovereign state of India under the constitution of India, where the sovereignty of the nation was being promoted. So the sovereignist way of looking at Portilla has been very much there in the literature. Another way of looking at Kautilya so far has been to project Kautilya Gartha Shastra and Mauryan Magad as the Indian version of the Roman Empire. And as the decline of the Roman Empire heralded the beginning of European feudalism, Indian historians uh, try to project the rise of Indian feudalism after the decline of this centralized bureaucratic monarchy of the Mauryas, where the paid servants of the state did the administration, not the Samantas. After the decline of the Mauryas, the bureaucratic organ of the state, paid salariate of the state, uh, was dispensed with largely. And Sovereignty was passed down to feudal Jagirda, feudal Samantas, later under the Delhi Sultanate, Iktadars, under the Mughal state to Jagirdars, 
the same feudal tradition continue. So, so far there have been two ways of looking at Tortilla. Uh, you and uh, an Indologist, a Dutch Indologist, Easterman, have given us a new way of looking at Tortilla. Easterman has argued that it's at least the text, Mauryan history, uh, and may have somewhat different version, but at least reading the text, one doesn't find that Cotillia has succeeded in making uh, a centralized bureaucratic monarchy because there are elements of pluralism or plurality in the state and society uh, in the text of the Asa Shastra. Firstly, uh, you know, uh, the duality between Brahmins and the Kshatriyas. Kshatriyas power based on morality. Uh, sorry, Brahmin power based on morality. Kshatriya power based on the coercive arm of the state. The two, duality between the two has been sought to be subdued by the sovereignist interpretation of the state as I see it. And the feudal, Indian feudal theory has tried to subdue or suppress the uh, non-sovereignist or civil society power of the civil society elements in the state. Uh, uh, you know, uh, so, and your version, I, I think there is no time to elaborate, but I just wanted to make these point, two points. And the third point I wish to emphasize, and I learned a lot and got a new way of reading Cotillia is to read Cotillia with an eye of an economist and a moralist. Uh, so far, it seems to me I am also partly a product of the uh, pre balvir Sihar way of reading Cotillia. Uh, because, you know, uh, we, we have not, uh, you know, we have not given attention to the economist in Cotillia and the sociologist in Cotillia. Uh, and the legal approach that you also mentioned, and you in one of your writings you have also emphasized that, you know, Cotillia was the first text in Indian classical tradition in which a state was given power to make its own laws. Before Cotillia, the Hindu uh, theory of state did not give the king power to create laws only to enforce the Varnashram Dharma created by the civil society. The society created the laws and the king was only supposed to implement it. Kautilya for the first time says that the state has power to make its own laws and in case of conflict between the Dharma Nyaya of the state and the Sastric Nyayas, the Dharma Nyaya of the state will prevail. Uh, so, um, I, 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 uh, you know, there are many, uh, very many experts uh, who have been giving new insights uh, to people like me and perhaps others uh, for the last, uh, uh, you know, two days. Uh, the floor is open for your interventions. Yeah. Professor Chakravarti. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a couple of uh, my comments. Very brief. Yeah. Uh, continuing the Indian traditions. Indian seems to be very brief in their writings. Uh, 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 an excellent talk. We have it. the uh, idea should uh, continue being expounded on and on. Uh, uh, he, he, uh, he said, Poitrana Cheshadana Vina Chaya Chadushkitam, he quoted, and God doesn't act only on his own, but acts through his agents. And uh, Professor Balvin Sihar is one of such agents to rescue uh, us from the Duskrita and, and to protect the others both in India and outside. So that's his task. He has been performing that task. Now, uh, 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 about philosophy, I mean, in the strict sense, the narrow sense of philosophy, uh, it is supposed to be 
Pradipa Sarva Shastrana, which is Pradipa for all the all of it. Uh, but to that, uh, Gita uh, uh, intellect is important. But Gita has Buddhi Yoga, which should be grounded in yoga. It is not just simply intellect. That is one question. Uh, of course, uh, it shows my ignorance, which is, I think I read in the uh, Arthashastra once, please uh, enlighten me. The king who has a sound sleep is not the ideal king. <laughs> the king, the good king who is, has a sound sleep is sleeping. Uh, the king must be awake all the time. <laughs> Something like that I found. No, no, he is. Uh... He doesn't give him much sleep time, just a couple of few hours only. Yeah, yeah, not more than that. But, but he needs his sleep. Yeah, yeah certainly. <laughs> but, the, but the spirit of this is the king should be. Yes, ready. yes. So, um, so the last last point of mine is, uh, is uh, yes, yes. politics and economics, they do they blend together. In the name of monarchy, there is really uh, democracy is being cracked. So this is our Indian democracy. The king is there, but democracy is there. Yeah, you know, Chanakya at that time, he was writing education system for the prince. But in a democratic system, every child is a prince or princess. So whatever he said, we can apply that to every child. That's one part. Second part, the way we select in a democratic system, uh, there is no requirement to be a Gyan Yogi or a Karma Yogi. That's too bad. So if somehow, someday, we might get some un enlightened leaders. That's my hope. But let me make another point, which uh, has been really recognized by a lot of uh, judges. I wrote a paper, this is chapter 17 in my book, first book, that in earlier time, there used to be penance, that you feel guilt, you say, sorry what you have done. And there are a lot of requirements to keep fast or do social service or the full uh, feeling of guilt and repentance of that time. That was the penance. Now what the modern system has done, got away with that, and now there's a penalty. If there's an accident, pay that much to this person for the injury and so on. Kotala said, you got to keep both of them because two instruments are better than one instrument to change behavior. Now, unless the person feels guilty, he's never going to change. He will get into accident or other immoral things again. Now, I wrote this paper and sent to a, the most famous judge in America, uh, and I was not expecting a reply. And three days later, I got a reply from him. That is a fantastic paper. Now that system we can have in our country, the old system of penance that should come back. People should feel guilty and not uh, to repeat that again. But here they feel offended that how come I'm sued for this? They are basically not accepting their responsibility. So there are a lot of good things in our shastra. We can implement them without changing the constitution in a significant way. And the secular values of non-violence, uh, compassion, uh, tolerance, uh, manners against no one, truthfulness, cleanliness, these are secular values. Where is Dharma? I mean, religion is more than that. So this separation of religion and state, that was a mistake, total mistake. We should get back to our Vedic virtues, introduce in the class, and they are not interfering with any religion. That should be done by the government. Things will change uh, for the better. So that's my suggestion. There are a lot, a lot of suggestions in this book and the previous book. And uh, it should be, of course, appreciated if people read it and um, implement that. Yes, sir. Professor Makaranda Paranjit. Uh, yes, I'm sorry I haven't been able to listen to all the sessions. But as this conference is unfolding, I think we are achieving a wonderful uh, conviviality, conversationality, but also uh, the relevance of uh, classical Indian thought to our times in reconstructing India after this, you know, 
centuries long period of uh, slavery and stagnation. Yeah. The different on our souls. Exactly. Yeah. Now the different. Yeah. Exactly. The different ways in which this can be done is unfolding. So I'm very grateful to Shitan Shuddha and all of you. And you gave us a wonderful presentation. Thank you so much. I'm thankful to you people. <laughs> and uh, I think Professor Adi Singh gave a wonderful presidential comment. I just wanted to add a line to what you said, sir. That I think Professor Sihag and others are also emphasizing the idea of Raj Rishi. I think the next uh, presentation is also going to be on that, which is different from the sovereignist and the feudalist interpretation of Kautelya. Uh, we have to somehow bring back the idea of the Raja Rishi uh, into our polity and uh, into our society because it's social values in the end that will shape our polity as well as our economy. But my question to you, sir, is that I've read your article. Uh, no, 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 please never say, sir. That's a British word and I don't like it. Mahoda, Mahoda, Mahoda. It doesn't matter, but anyhow, no, it's to show respect. Uh, just, yeah, just that's a leave. It's, just it's, a leave. Leave. You know. it's a way to show respect. Yeah. Yeah. My question is, you have repeatedly claimed that Adam Smith stole from Kautilya. Yeah, yeah, yes. But what is the evidence? Because, as we know it, I mean, I have some sort of my own hunches about this, which we can talk about. But what we know as of now is that the text of Arthashastra was discovered in 1905 by a man from Tanjore, an anonymous Tanjore Brahmin who brought the text to the librarian of the Maharaja of Mysore's library, whose name was Rudra Patnam Shama Shastri, in 1905. And then the first edition of the text, as we know it, comes out in about 1920s. So where is the... Yeah, so, let me, let me so I just want to finish. Now, we yeah. in literature, we do source and influence studies. And there are some parameters to establish sources. And all that you have done in your presentation and in your article so far, is to show parallelisms. That Adam Smith says something, and Kautilya says something very similar. Now, that does not prove source. Or, yeah, I, I, yeah. I just prove one way. Like Machiavelli, he gives an example that if you want to take action against somebody, are the king, we should never do unpopular things like putting taxes or tax collectors. We should never take the responsibility. We should give the responsibility to someone who will be hated and maybe gotten rid of. Uh, this is in Macmillan. Now, Seneca says that, that if you want to get rid of somebody, give him the job of tax collection and then make him unpopular and get rid of them. <laughs> Macmillan stole that from there. No, but what is the evidence? At this no is the evidence when no, you... No. This, this is, is a textual this, evidence. No, this does not constitute evidence. This constitutes similarity. Mm -hmm. Evidence means he has read, he had access to the text. So I'm not disagreeing that Kautilian ideas may have permeated. Certainly they permeated all over Asia. Okay, region. okay, let me give so another... One minute. Yeah. Why, why I am very concerned about such claims is that they make you a hero. Yeah. in a section of our right wing. Mm -hmm. And they love this, that everything came from India, we are the greatest. And they do this in a very crude, unprofessional, unproductive, and harmful yes, yes, way. Yes, yes, you're right. Now you're giving, you're giving a handle to such people, uh, I'm afraid. I think we have to be very careful as scholars. No, 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 I'm very careful. No, we have to show evidence. Yeah. Yeah, to show when, when the yeah. text was not available until 1905, as of our present day knowledge, and our present day knowledge is not perfect, we have to do the careful excavation to prove that Adam Smith had access to this text. Now, what happens is everybody says Adam Smith was a great plagiarist and he burned all his sources. Yeah. Wow! I mean, this is a wonderful way not to do the excavation. He couldn't have burned everything in all the libraries. So there are careful methodologies. Yeah, yeah no, 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 I, I get your point. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, let me make one point. In Adam Smith's book, Wealth of Nations, there is an example of division of labor. He takes a pin factory and how it was by different hands it was constructed, it was built. 
अमृत स्वरूप गु सर्वे अमृत निधान Namaskar and good morning to all of you dignitaries here. I began with an invocation and prayer to my modern Rishi, Brahmarshi Satyadev, to whose spiritual lineage I have my allegiance. <clears throat> I stand here uh, with a lot of intimidation because I am not an academic philosopher. Like most of you, so my presentation will be a bit different from the rational, analytical, technical mode of presentation that you have been used to in the last one and a half days. I'm also intimidated to come and speak after such an illustrious scholar like Balbir Singh Ji, an authority on economics and authority on accounting. But as I start speaking, I would request you. Beyond the walls, visually, just think that there are hundreds of young MBA students are sitting and listening to us because we are introducing Rajeshi leadership or leadership and ethics. My title is leadership and ethics. Part of which is Rajeshi leadership. They are also listening to us. What? Do we have for them? Well, that is also my concern as I speak. I begin with a personal episode. September 2002, the flagship seminar of Aspen Institute was being held in Colorado Aspen Meadows. I happened to be a participant there. The keynote of the seminar went around. What they call great conversations and lessons for modern leadership. The sources of wisdom range from Bible, Greek philosophy, and travel down history to Tolstoy and Gandhi. Throughout the week, the participants were kept intensely engaged in exploring selected portions from these priceless pieces of world literature and collect pertinent insights and wisdom for modern leadership. The pedagogy followed in the entire seminar. Kindle the spirit of dialogue among the participants in all discussions. For me, the seminar opened up a new vista of learning for enhancing leadership consciousness. What is that? How to learn from dialogues and how to engage in dialogues for facilitating collaborative learning? Correct me if I am wrong. Modern academia, especially in India. Had groomed me well in the culture of debate, but not so much in dialogue. There's a difference between debate and dialogue, which I would like to begin with. You know, debate is a win-lose situation all the time. One is pushed <coughs> against the other. Dialogue is a learning situation where I suspend my position and I'm keen to listen to the others, even if I don't agree with them 100%. So. You know, because when in, the, in the beginning, yesterday, Dr. Parajpay talked about uh, Bhagavad Gita. Forget that <coughs> what wrongs have been done. Just think of this: that in the middle of this battlefield, a dialogue is happening. This is the first thing I would like to highlight: the spirit of dialogue. There goes an old saying: those who look deepest into the past can also see the farthest into the future. So I began my journey into the past, always with an eye to bring out something worthwhile for us in the present. Here we begin with a cross-cultural conversation that took place to the, in the terrain of India millennia ago, as retold. You no, know, Mukherjee was talking about source. Retold by a leading management academic who also happens to be the present director of IIM Kozhikode in his book called Leading Consciously. Published in 1998 from Butterworth High. This is the episode. Alexander the Great, with his mighty army, has come to the western part of the Indian landmass. 
the final destination of his journey. The Greek contingent was camping on the bank of the river Jalam. Every morning, the prince himself on horseback would go and you know, himself supervise their morning drilling sessions, preparing them for the battle. And while doing that, every day he would notice that at the end of the field, where the forest began, under a tree was sitting a very strange looking, a weird Indian. Why weird? Barren, barren body, bare body. Loin clothes, long hair, long beard, sitting in a particular position and looking at the horizons for hours. So he's a strange Indian. So Alexander was intrigued. What this guy is doing? So one day he, with the help of local people, goes and starts a conversation. We see you every day sitting under the tree for hours, looking at the horizons. What are you really doing? The prince asked. No answer. Alexander started getting impatient. Uh, uh, kept his cool and asked again. While we are gearing up for the battle, we find you here sitting, doing nothing. What are you up to? No answer. The prince was on the threshold of his patience. Still he collected himself, came close to the man and asked, you can at least tell us what is your purpose in life because of which you are sitting here for hours every day doing nothing. <coughs> this time the old man looks up at the prince and asks questions. Will you tell, tell me one thing? What is your purpose in life? Oh, you don't know I am Alexander the Great and I am here to conquer the world. That's why I am in India. Oh, you will conquer the world. Fine, after that what will you do? Narayana said, after that I will take all the horses and the elephants from the country which I conquered back to my own country. Will you take all the horses and the elephants to Macedonia? Grant it. You achieve that after that what will you do? After that I will take all the men as slaves, the prisoners of war, and all the men from these countries as our entertainers in Greece. My God, what an ambition. Prince, suppose at some point in life you also achieve that. Men as slaves you take, prisoners of war, women as entertainers in Greece. And after that, what would you do? Then Alexander was quiet for some time. But he never was a smart guy, he was a student of Aristotle, as you have already learned. Uh, he smiled and said, Sir, after that, probably I will sit on my throne and relax. And the old man said, That's what I'm doing. This is a classic example of an encounter between two cultures with some powerful messages for all leaders and teachers. Modern organizations operate in a world where there is a confluence of myriads of cultural entities, each with its own unique characteristics and values, which may often conflict with each other. The episode above throws light on the mood, mood, and tenor of conversations across cultures so that communication may flow smoothly without any deadlock. Alexander is a supreme embodiment of an outgoing, aggressive tendency dominant in certain elements of the Western culture. Balbiti was yesterday talking about grabbing, no? It was an epitome of that. It's very similar to the modern corporate leader with a compulsive drive to kill and win. Single pointed focus on the bottom line at any cost with an eye only on the financial parameters like profits, turnovers, sales and market characterize their dominant mood and mindset. Any input on ethics, values, cooperation, or sustainability sounds completely irrelevant and demotivating for most of these people. Like our young youngsters when they come to you know, study MBA. Yes, they want to come for some knowledge, but their eyes are on the placement week. Absolutely. You know, that is a fact of the matter. And I have been to the placement chair now, so I know that very well for the last five years. Like Alexander, they are the repository of selfish energy that is exteriorized by Hilmuki. Directed outward and acquisitive in nature with no time and space for reflection. Now attention to critical issues like value, sustainability, goodwill and social responsibility or ethics or quality of life will demand some moments of reflection in our mind space that most of the dynamic leaders are unable to appreciate or practice because of their unidirectional trust 
on numbers and results within a short time frame. In that kind of a scenario, how does one inculcate a sense of values or ethics enduring and wholesome for the individual and the organization? The Indian sage in this episode is a manifestation of human energy drawn inward, which opens our doors of inner perception through <coughs> contemplation and reflection. This provides us insight into not only how to see the, see the world in depth and totality as it is, but also engage with the world even when it is hostile and different. The approach adopted by the sage is important to study and consider in this regard. Since the beginning, the old man had noticed that dynamic prince was impatient to know about him. So he chose to remain silent to the initial questions that were superficial in nature and asked in a hurry by the prince. Then he found Alexander getting close to him and asking a deeper question, purpose of life. The nature and very tenor of the question has radically changed by now. And the sage chose to respond, but only with a counter question about the purpose of life directed to the prince. The initial response to the prince was symptomatic of his aggressive, acquisitive, and externally directed energy and mindset. Conquest of the world, cap the capturing the world, horses, elephants, enslaving men and women, etc. <coughs> Excuse me. What is interesting to know. <coughs> Never during the conversation, it is very important. Never during the conversation, the sage <coughs> stopped this outward flow of energy of the prince, but actually fueled it further to get the full steam out of the galloping prince. Nor did he intervene in the outgoing movement of the prince with sermons of right or wrong from the Indian point of view. That would have led to get to confrontation. And the conversation would have come to a block, deadlock. But the sage kept the flow, flow on smoothly and rapidly enough. Alexander went out of steam with no way ahead. Then the final answer came from the mouth of Alexander, who uttered it with a sigh, almost pushed against the wall. The sage never gave the answer. The answer came from Alexander. The sage merely endorsed the same. That's what I'm doing. <coughs> this is the approach of a true Indian master who never blocks the energy of the opponent in a hostile force or the hostile force, but uses the energy of the rival power to his advantage and plants the seeds of transformation in the other very subtly. He achieves this by asking the deeper questions but never dilutes the conversation by giving answers to superficial questions. He keeps the conversations alive and flowing and helps the other find his own answers. So many professors and teachers are sitting here. I'm sure we know that the mediocre students are those who will look for answers from us. And the real good students are those who don't want the answers from us will always appreciate if we help them ask the right questions, the deeper questions, and help them find their own answers. Because who knows, their answers may be different from our answers. Now, the above conversation also points us towards the quintessential, quintessential, sorry, quintessential model of leadership as propounded by the sages of in ancient India, Rajushi. Rajushi is a conjoint word that necessitates the combination of Raja, the secular executive leader, and Rishi, the sacred and the sagacious wisdom leader. The golden combination culminates in what you know my uh, my revered teacher and my previous boss, who's no more, Professor Dr. S. K. Chakraborty. He also she comes from Chakraborty, uh, the pioneer of the movement of human values and Indian ethos in the field of management education and the founder of the Management Center for Human Values at the Indian Institute of Management, Calcutta. He had called it a sacro-secular symbiosis, Im implying that the secular must be led in the light of the sacred that will culminate in enlightened leadership based on values and ethics for the all-round welfare of the organizations, society, and the planet at large. Otherwise, it will result in dominantly skills-driven Behaviorally smart 
acquisitive and aggressive leadership mindset as epitomized by Alexander without much foundation of ethics and values with least concern for the welfare of humanity. Rajarshi embodies the authentic Vedantic model of leadership which lifts the consciousness from the greedy secular path towards a self-fulfilling <coughs> spiritual one. Chapter 14, 1995. The Bhagavad Gita has identified the spiritually inspired higher purpose as Loka Sangha, not pursuit of careerism through cutthroat competition. Now every nation and culture has its notion of highest and the most inspiring and venerated model of the human being. For India across the millennia, the highest model of man has been the Rishi. Etymologically, there are three concurrent meanings of the word Rishi. <coughs> One, an eternal traveler or pilgrim. Two, a seer of totality. And number three, a piercer of the veil of darkness, darkness of ignorance. Indian history and culture is replete with such inspiring models of Rajesh leadership. Like Buddha and Chandragupta, Janakya and Harshavartan, Guru Govind Singh and Vidyaranya, Shankara and Vivekananda, Gandhi and Nitaji. The secret of their superlative charisma has been the high minded pursuit of self, self restraint, self control, self sacrifice and renunciation. Higher order character, founded on authentic spiritual values, lay at the core of their charisma. Thereby, they attained inner freedom which is concomitant of love. It may be clarified here that such love is not expressed narrowly as nepotism or favoritism, but as boundless impersonal love that, number one, radiates equally in all directions, and number two, is not contingent on reciprocation. Thus, they are celebrated in history as the eternal leaders of humanity, not just of groups of or quotidians. Now, positivist Rationalist, quantitative social science and management literature has given abundant <coughs> emphasis on behavior. But the word character has been almost banished from modern academic writings in management. Chakraborty emphasized the need for robust and inspiring character in leadership with, imp with impressive behavior. As charismatic leadership is born out of conviction, not out of calculation. In some of the enlightened thinkers in management from the West, the importance of character has been also highlighted in the modern times. I just give you two quotes. This is from <coughs> Kostenbaum uh, in Journal of Applied Behavioral Sciences, 1990. Behavioral change certainly has its place in management development, but for senior managers to significantly change the way they lead their organization, Behavioral change by itself is often not enough. Instead, some type of change in character or identity is required. And he continues, character is a way of enhancing or protecting one's own sense of self-worth through deep-seated strategies and ingrained beliefs about oneself and the external world. And the last one, this is by <coughs> Warren Bennis, you know, he was one of the great leadership masters who wrote extensively in Harvard Business Review. He writes, the essence of leadership stems from the leader's soul rather than from his or her behavior. Great leadership is not primarily a function of behavior and technique. No amount of behavioral technique will substitute for the genuine commitment of the leaders of, <coughs> of, leaders of their vision. Okay, uh, so when, when, when we studied management, we had organization, behavior, behavioral sciences, nothing much was uh, you know, written on character. Uh, Dr. Chakraborty had uh, made this breakthrough in the early 80s when no one was talking about these things, uh, introducing the notion of character and values uh, and their importance. Uh, today we have courses on business ethics all over the place, but I'm talking about 13, 40 years back, and uh, people looked at us with suspicion. But uh, the movement grew. Uh, let me carry on from here. Chakraborty's models and concepts were deeply rooted in the insights from such enlightened thinkers in modern times from the West, like Einstein, Heisenberg, Bertrand Russell, Arnold <coughs> Turnby, Schumacher, Petrin Solokin, Jeremy Refkin, among others. 
and more prominently by the lives and works of the Golden Indian Quartet. Rabindranath Tagore, Swami Vivekananda, Mahatma Gandhi, and Sri Aurobindo. I'll just show you something. <coughs> these four masters, four quick slides. These are the, you know, learning points for Rajeshi leaders in modern times. Learn from nature and life. Listen to the call of the wild. These are the two things we learn from many others, or we not to which I would like to highlight. Swamiji, wisdom leadership, the importance of being the child-like leader, and demonstrating love in action. So you're open. Fist with silence and solitude. <coughs> These famous words, silence prepares, speech creates. Here our uh, convener, Professor Chandravarti uh, Shitanshila, he had asked me what is the difference between philosopher king and uh, Prabhishi. Would you highlight from that? So this engagement in silence and solitude is one of the keynotes of the ancient Indian model of leadership, Pradeshi leadership, where you find Janaka going out of the palace and spending time with men of spiritual caliber, men of the Rishi caliber, getting the wisdom and coming back and ruling the country. We find uh, in Bhaktivedanta Upanishad, the interaction between Janashruti and Red Pope. Again, uh, in, sorry, in Chandogya Upanishad. In Bhaktivedanta, we find uh, the interaction between Jagyavalta and uh, Janaka. The you know, famous six questions raised by Jagyavalta, uh, by Janaka, and the answers by Jagyavalta. You know, so these interactions between the Rajas and the Rishis, it is one of the ongoing interaction. It was a constant source of enrichment for the ancient Indian who epitomized the Rajeshi leadership. This is something which we do not find so much even in some of the inspiring leaders of modern times in the field of business. But I would like to uh, present to you one particular leader with whom I have spent my life uh, for 10 days in total. Uh, who passed away while doing a lecture in Ayam Shivam, Dr. David Jabul Zara. Now he embodied this, this model of uh, Radish leadership at its highest. You know, during the day I had found him in certain moments of you know, the day he would <coughs> on his own. And I had asked him, sir, what are you doing? He said, in every house there has to be a corner of us, your I didn't talk about Dr. Kalam on and on, but I won't. But I just give this example. People ask, what, what are the present examples? The best example for me is Dr. Abdul Kalam. Of course, in, from the field of business, there are the examples of G.R.D. Tata and uh, also Jamshed Ji Tata. And Jamunal Bajaj was, was mentioned by uh, one of our senior uh, participants here yesterday. Uh, some examples were given by Ananda in his uh, presentation. I won't say it is accepted by most of the leaders today, no. But this is an alternative that we are exploring and slowly being accepted as important by business leaders. <coughs> I can only make this humble claim. Uh, Gandhi, the awareness of the ground reality, sensitivity to the ground reality. And the talisman, which was, I won't uh, repeat it, given by <coughs> Palmi Singh a few moments back. So I go back. Mm. 
Now, what are the two sources I have taken from ancient Indian wisdom which can inspire to create the Radish leaders of modern times? One is Upanishads, specifically Taittiriya Upanishads, where we have the concept of the five koshas, five layers. The underlying kosha constitutes the gross body of the individual and the material universe. How is it relevant to us in business? The physical layout of the organization comprising land, buildings, plants, and physical structures comes within the fold of this layer. Pranamaya kosha constitutes the basic life-giving vital force of the individual, so that so important for survival, and also the field of energy that flows in the natural universe for its sustenance. In the context of the organization, this refers to the buoyancy, the dynamism, the abundant flow of information, and the spirit of aggressive competition for survival that is represented by Pranamaya Kosha. Manomaya Kosha, or the mental sheath, constitutes the mental world of the individual comprising choices and preferences, vibrations of desires, thoughts, and ideas, which also expand to include the universe. Healthy and receptive employee mindset, emotional competence, and amicable corporate culture are its organizational manifestations. Vigyanamaya Kosha, sheath of wisdom, this marks the entry from the vast field of worldly knowledge, the pristine knowledge of the self and its natural organic connection with the universe and its subtle forces. Questions on purpose of life and sustenance of the planet at large become critically important at this level. Engagement with vision, mission, values, self-actualization and sustainability issues become the organizational priorities at this layer of consciousness. Anandamaya Kosha, <coughs> Akshita, of this, this is a subtlest layer of existence finding expression in the experience of pure bliss amidst dualities of joy and sorrow, happiness and misery, success and failure. Oh, this is very important in the modern world today in the business. Now, we live in a world which we call in modern time, it's called a VUCA world. V-U-C-A. What is V-U-C-A? V for volatility, U for uncertainty, C for complexity, and A for ambiguity. The business is operating in this kind of a VUCA world. So in this VUCA world, there are two major roadblocks in the modern management education, you know, which makes us incompetent to deal with the VUCA world. One is the development of linear logic, linear thinking, and the other is the binary way of looking at the world. Now, <coughs> these two are developed, unfortunately, in the students through mainstream education. <coughs> what, you know, when we talk about these four grades, I just shared Tagore, Gandhi, Swamiji, and Sri Aurobindo. When we expose these <coughs> leadership models, they help somewhat to clear out these cobwebs so that they are exposed to what is natural thinking and they don't have a binary vision. They have a holistic, all encompassing vision. Otherwise, it's only either fully profit oriented, fully money driven, and on one track they're progressing. You cannot change that track. That is one of the major problems. You know, in the year 2004, uh, Ian Metroff, uh, he was a professor emeritus of uh, Marshall Goldman Institute of Management in the US. He sent a letter to the directors and deans of all the business schools. What is going wrong in business education? He highlighted many points. Three points I would like to mention here. Number one, you know, we have been successful in achieving these, number one, giving the students a, a narrow, distorted view of human nature, one. Number two, a mean and constricted, repudiated notion of ethics. And number three, nurturing a sense of helplessness and hopelessness among the students and also the faculty in these businesses. <coughs> so these are the three vanities he identified, you know, to which the kind of work that we are trying to do, you know, are uh, trying to address. I don't say we are completely successful, but the attempt is going on. <coughs> now, from the five koshas model, what 
what are the leadership learnings? The following pertinent lessons on the process of learning can be crystallized for leaders in organizations from this ancient text. One, a graded stepwise and integral approach is essential for proper assimilation of knowledge. The sage in the Upanishad takes the student along all the five stages so that the consciousness and knowledge of the recipient can evolve in a progressive manner. Number two, there has to be an intrinsic respect for the acquired knowledge at all five levels, from the grossest to the subtlest. To achieve this, the sage opens this deliberation on each stage by identifying each sheet, be it anna, prana, mano, manas, with the highest principle in the universe or Brahman. This also safeguards against any feeling of arrogance or disdain towards learners at the preliminary stages by those who have progressed ahead of the others in the higher stages. For a leader, number three, for a leader, there has to be not only awareness of this entire spectrum of knowledge, but also sensitivity to the specific stage of learning of a particular recipient. Otherwise, knowledge absorption will not be effective. Often, one finds inspiring messages on vision and values do not create impact on the people in organizations as most of the members of the target audience may be just in the initial stages of the learning path and cannot appreciate it. Number four, each layer has a significant role to play in our learning path. Often we find a misplaced notion at work in, in our minds that the sages that the stages and experiences, sorry, that the stages and experiences we have left behind are no more important and relevant to us. As if material knowledge loses its priority amidst our concern for value or sustainability. Wisely enough, the sage, after completing his inputs on all the layers, warns the learner, don't despise matter. After completing the full stage, coming back to stage one, then don't despise this. Number five, the process of exploration at every stage, or the, you know, if you call it ascesis, or pursue, is called tapas, or intense striving for perfection to reach the ultimate goal. What is more profound, at every stage, this striving also has been identified in Brahman, the highest principle. The path is as much important as the destination. The following lines from Tagore make it succinct. My pilgrimage is not at the end of the road. My temples are all there on both sides of my pathway. There is a Bengali version. The English one is saying, My pilgrimage is not at the end of the road. My temples are all there on both sides of my pathway. Coming to Bhagavad Gita, now, <coughs> Rupati has uh, extensively covered about the, on the crisis. Uh, in our own way, as we relate to the management students, I'll just give a few inputs. What was the crisis? In our journey of life, personal as well as professional, we often face situations which present to us alternative courses of action. This results in experience of conflict. What is interesting to note is that when the valiant Arjuna makes his entry in the battlefield of Kurukshetra, chapter 1 of the Bhagavad Gita, there was no crisis at his point of entry. Upon arrival, he makes a statement with charioteer. By the way, in chapter 1, the Lord does not speak. Entirely a conversation by Arjuna and some converse, you know, statement by uh, Sanjaya. And one statement by Mithrashtra, I think. So the Arjuna tells the charioteer, please place my chariot between the two columns of war. I want to see who are there in the enemy right now. Senayar ubaya mati, ratam sthavaya meyachuta. Very confident, perhaps a little more confident. And that's what the Lord had noticed. Now the Lord could have placed the chariot anywhere in between the two lineups. We think, we think again, that here the Lord used his discretion and that was a turning point of this Mahabharata. Had the chariot been placed in front of a Dujodhana or any of the Kaurava brothers, perhaps this wouldn't have been a crisis. But where does the Lord position it? Bhishma Drona Pramukhata. In front of the two stalwarts. Stored, following the story of the Mahabharata, among the 105 brothers, 100 Kauravas and 5 Pandavas, two, both 
Bhishma Pitamaha and also Dronacharya the Guru, the dearest was Arjuna. And the relationship was reciprocal in terms of all reverence, respect for them from Arjuna. And hence the crisis precipitates. Well, Urbati had addressed it at a higher level, but uh, I will again come back to the psychological level because this it is something which the people in the or in the in our MBA curriculum can relate much better. So the rational mind says, "You are a warrior. You are a Kshatriya. You have come to fight. You cannot go back. There is a credo of the Kshatriya. You cannot turn your back." The emotion says, "With whom are you going to fight?" Well, that is the crisis. How does the Lord intervene? That is, you know, that is where the leadership communication. You know, for our students, we try to expose. So this is where Arjuna is in a state of crisis. Na yosya di govind na mukpatushni bahuva. He sat down on the ground, not ready to fight. Now, in someone in a certain that kind of a crisis situation. What will the counselor do? He'll try to get a comfortable environment. Give the counseling. The Lord does not do it. Chapter 2, the Lord intervenes. And the first statement by the Lord, please mark it. The first statement by the Lord is a blast. Huge blast. From where did this crisis come to you? It was not there with you some time before. <coughs> It does not fit the alien warrior. Full blast. And after that, what the Lord does? Rupadi had told in, in her presentation. The Lord does not speak about whether you are going to fight or not going to fight. Because Arjuna had lost his contact with his own deeper self. So he tries to revive that contact with his original self. 20 slokas he devotes to the extolling of the glory of the self. Some of the best slokas of the Bhagavad Gita come one after the other. No. You know I am not going to repeat that. So that the Arjuna who had lost his sense of the self, the anchorage by seeing the two stalwarts in front of him, the Lord puts him back to the memory of the self from where he will revive the energy and finally come back to fight. The I or the real self of Arjuna got trapped and constricted in the spatio temporal domain of Kurukshetra and has to be liberated and experienced in its fullness and glory in order to come, in, come to terms with this dilemma. The purpose of this discourse was to bring back the consciousness of Arjuna to the center of his I and experience the full knowledge and potential of the I for prior to engagement in action. The Gita thus offers a three-tier sequential methodology for the resolution of this conflict. Each stage actually implies a progressive evolution of human consciousness into a superior level of knowledge. The three steps are as follows. One, disengagement from the problem. Be because with all my existing material and intellectual resources, I am unable to cope with the crisis. First six chapters of the Gita provide us with the necessary insights and details pertaining to this part of the evolution of our consciousness. The dominant running theme here is karma or action, but action that is centripetal in movement so that the individual can get inner consolidation and repose. The, you know, the highest point of which is the state of sthita Prakya in chapter 2. Number 2. Engagement higher wisdom. Through loving and emotive communion with the source of enlightened knowledge through Bhagavad for comprehensive assimilation of this wisdom through intimate personal contact. Bhakti Yuga was mentioned by Rupali yesterday in response to a question. Um, so, the theme running to the next six chapters, 7 to 12, is one of bhakti or devotion. Number three, re engagement in the problem. The Gita does not recommend the cessation of the journey at the highest point of attainment of enlightened knowledge. The last six chapters, deal with the descent of human consciousness from the level of highest wisdom to the specific context of the problem in question of in, in question in order that the attained wisdom can be translated into the requisite action through a process of re-engagement re but now with an enlightened perspective. Dhyana or specialized knowledge 
<coughs> that emerges from the human wisdom, but applied in the immediate context of action becomes the running theme of this last phase of evolution. As I mentioned to you, friends, uh, the first statement by the, word, by the Lord was a question. It is also interesting to note, chapter 18, the last statement by the Lord, again are two questions. So you see, the teacher, the master at the end of the discourse asks two questions, like feedback in our sessions. Have you listened to me with proper attention? Has it cleared your problem which has engulfed your mind in the very beginning, born out of delusion? What is the death learning for us? When we engage in enlightened leadership, wisdom leadership, or Adishi, whatever you call it, we must be ready to begin the dialogue with a question and also end the dialogue with questions so that we keep the room open for the next dialogue with the question we end with. And then we go on to the next round of dialogue. So it's, it's very interesting, you know. In a usually masked, usually in a spiritual discourse, it's the student who asks the questions and the teacher, the master, the spiritual leader who gives the answers. Here it is just the opposite. First, there was no crisis. The Lord creates a crisis. <coughs> and this man falls, the protagonist completely collapses under the crisis. The Lord begins his conversation with a blasting question, carries on for 18 chapters, and concludes his conversation, 18th chapter, with two questions. This is something which is very unique, we found, and we try to communicate it to our students and begin a dialogue with question, <coughs> end a dialogue with question, but the level at which you address the question in, in the beginning will be different from the way you address the question in the end. <coughs> I will now come to the towards the end of my, close to, close to the end of my presentation, uh, with a leader of my passion and inspiration. So, I <coughs> first, I would like to can you please? No, I'm still. something which I found very interesting. Ah. What are the seven characteristics of a Rajashi leader? The very rare quote which I found, Yadati Shubhas was one enlightened leader. On his modern leader, Swami Vivekananda. There are seven characteristics. Reckless in his sacrifice. Unceasing in his activity. Boundless in his love, number three. Profound and versatile in his wisdom, number four. Exuberant in his emotions, number five. Merciless in his attacks, number six. But yet simple as a child. He was a rare personality in this world of ours. If Swamiji would have been alive today, he would have been my guru, unquote. It's a list of virtues. All. Yeah. All. I would be reckless in his sacrifice, unceasing in his activity, boundless in his love, profound and versatile in his wisdom, exuberant in his emotions, merciless in his attacks, but yet as simple as a child. You know, the rare personality in this world of ours. If Swamiji would have been alive today, he would have been my guru. Friends, it's very difficult to find uh, an assessment of Swamiji no. from one great master being assessed by another great. You know, like, like I, I, I can only, you know, think of, think back of the documentary made on Tagore by Satyajit Ray. 
of in the year 1961. <coughs> One great master, when he assesses the other, it gives a completely different you know, texture and color to that entire assessment. <coughs> so this is what I thought I'd share with you. <coughs> Before that, uh, how do you go back? I would like to before I come to my conclusion, I would just want to come to the second postscript. So when we talk about leadership or our issue leadership to our students, how do we communicate to them to make it, you know, two things interesting and number two relevant. Because otherwise they have found people come and give wrong lectures, people have the knowledge, people have the good intentions, but the students are not interested. This has been my experience in the last 26 years on this topic. So one has come to this conclusion that whatever we communicate, we have to communicate it, that it has to be interesting to them. Because there are so many things which are interesting to them in the modern world. So many things are distracting their interest. How can we get back their interest? How can we make it relevant to them? So I'm just giving you two examples. You know, one is the leadership learning. That the Rajasthi leader or the wisdom leader always is in a state of learning. And one of the sources of learning is from children. Is from children. I'll give you an example of this. One day, the father of a very wealthy family took his son on a trip to a country with the firm purpose of showing how his son, how poor people live. They spent a couple of days and nights on the farm of what could be considered as a very poor family. On their return from the trip, the father asked his son how was the trip. It was great, Dad. Did you see how poor people live? The father asked. Oh yes, said the son. So tell me, what did you learn from the trip learning? The son answered. I saw that we have one dog and they had four. We have a pool that reaches to the middle of the garden and they have a creek that has no end. We have imported lanterns in our garden and they have the stars at the night. Our patio reaches out to the front yard and they have the whole horizon. We have a small piece of land to live on and they have fields that go beyond our sight. We have servants to serve us but they serve others. We buy our food but they grow theirs. We have walls around our property to protect us. They have their friends to protect them. The boy's father was speechless. Then his son added, thanks <coughs> dad for showing me how poor we are. So the way the fresh mind looks at the same reality. The father was a good, good person. He wanted to show because they come from a rich family. They should, the boy should know how the poor people live. The boy is not, you know, contaminated if by modern education. Our, our, our understanding of what is richness, what is affluence, and what is poverty. So he looks at this from a completely natural, if I may say, uh, point of view, and he gives this insight. So learning from the children is a very important thing. And the other thing I <coughs> want to highlight, I mentioned about it when I was talking about your window. So what is the power of silence? What is the power of silence, and how can it stimulate creativity? We can say that you know these are words from the ancient sages, they are words on the modern greats. But what about the modern times? So here is an example which can we get from Yeah. Yes. November 18, 1995, Itzhak Perelman, the violinist, came on stage to give a concert at Avery Fisher Hall, Lincoln Center in New York City. If you have ever been to a Perlman concert, you know that getting on stage is no small achievement for him. He was stricken with polio as a child, and so he has braces on both legs and walks with the aid of two crutches. To see him walk across the stage one step at a time, painfully and slowly, is an awesome sight. He walks painfully, yet majestically, until he reaches his chair. Then he sits down slowly, puts his crutches on the floor, undoes the clasp on his legs, tucks one foot back, and extends the other foot forward. Then he bends down and picks up the violin, puts it under the chin, 
nods the conductor and proceeds to play. By now the audience is used to this ritual. They sit quietly while he makes his way across the stage to the chair. They remain reverently silent while he unders the glass on his legs. They wait until he is ready to play. But this time something went wrong. <coughs> Just as he finished the first few bars, one of the strings of his violin broke. You could hear it snap. It went off like gunfire across the room. There was no mistaking what that sound meant. There was no mistaking what he had to do. We figured that he would have to get up, put on the glass again, pick up the crutches and limp his way off stage to either find another violin or else find another string for this one. But he didn't. Instead, he waited a moment, closed his eyes and then signaled the conductor to begin again. Very important. Waited a moment, closed his eyes and signaled the conductor to begin again. The orchestra began and he played from where he had left. And he played with such passion and such power and such purity as they had never heard before. Of course, anyone knows that it is important, it is impossible to play a symphonic work with just three strings. I know that, you know that, but this time, Rist itself with the man refused to know that. You could see him modulating, changing, and recomposing the piece on his head. At one point, it sounded like he was detuning the strings to get new sounds from them that they had never made before. When we finished, there was an awesome silence in this room, in the room, and then the people rose and cheered. There was an extraordinary outburst of applause from every corner of the auditorium. We were all on our feet screaming and cheering, doing everything we could to show how much we appreciated what he had done. He smiled, wiped the sweat from his brow, raised his bow to quiet us, and then he said, not boastfully, but in a quiet, pensive, reverent tone, quote, you know, sometimes it is the artist's task to find out how much music you can still make with what you have left. What a powerful line that is! It has stayed in my mind ever since I heard it. And who knows, perhaps that is the definition of life, not just for artists, but for all of us. Here is a man who has prepared all his life to make music on a violin of four strings, who all of a sudden, in the, mu in the middle of the concert, finds himself with only three strings, so he makes music with three strings. And the music he made that night with just three strings was more beautiful, more sacred, more memorable than any that he had ever made before when he had four strings. <coughs> so perhaps our task in this changing, fast changing, bewildering world, the Buddha world we have talked about, in which we live, is to make music. At first with all that we have, and then when that is no longer possible, to make music with what we have made. So when we, you know, we were discussing about creativity yesterday in this, in this forum, this conference, how silence can be a source of creativity. When we talk to our students, instead of, you know, giving just examples from ancient times, we give them some examples of modern times also. You know, see, this is what has happened only 25 years back in New York City. So, Now, I would like to conclude again, uh, as I said, with a postscript. It was high in the snowy mountains of Himalayas. Swami Vivekananda, the patriot prophet of modern India, was on pilgrimage with a few chosen disciples. His intense meditation led him to a vision of Mother Kali, the black goddess, the mighty destroyer and time eternal lurking behind the veil of life. During one evening, in a state of high fever, he wrote a very famous poem that concludes, to him the mother comes. He is one sister Vivekananda. Vivekananda respect the wisdom of classical and ancient India as enshrined primarily in the Upanishads. At the all-encompassing domain of macro world, his message was founded on universal religion. His exhortation was fiery and inspirational, arise awake and stop not until the goal is more accessible. He exemplified an authentic synthesis of the East and the West, science and spirituality, contemplation and action. He was perhaps the most inspiring example of Rajashi leadership in modern times in India. 
ever a champion of harmony and inter integration, he chose the following motto for the organization, Ram Krishna Mission, Atmana Mukshartam Jagati Tayacha, for the salvation of the self and the welfare of the world, not either or, but simultaneously. Vivekananda, one more panel, please. One more panel. Yes, I'll have a mantra too. Just one more. Vivekananda said to a disciple, Sister Nibiri, meditate on death. Only by worship of the terrible can the terrible be overcome. There could be bliss in torture too. The heart must be a commissioned ground. Pride, selfishness, desire, all burn to ashes. Then and only then the mother comes. Is this a negative message? Is this a product of negative thinking? Vivekananda's own life was a saga of suffering and sacrifice, conflict and conviction, turbulence and transformation, a journey extraordinary, and odyssey to enlightenment. But he left us with the lesson to recognize and experience the play of all highest cosmic energy or principle, even in terror and anxiety, amidst trials and tribulations that you see around the world today. A die-hard optimist, he himself had to pass through the fire of hell even with a lifespan of less than 40 years. His biographer, the French Nobel laureate Romarola, remarked battle and life for him were synonymous. Leaders of tomorrow, when shall we learn from death and destruction of old orders for creative breakthroughs in our leadership roles and shape the very foundation of our outdated models and worn-out concepts, our tunnel vision and fossilized values by keeping alive and aflame just one precious element within our hearts, the passion to transform, to infuse the new needs of life in our organizations and the planet at large. Millennia ago, Socrates had exhorted us to think and look back within ourselves in anger and shame. An unexamined life is not worth living. Closer in time, the voice of Nietzsche sounded even more adventurous. He wants to live, wants to live dangerously. Friends, you may say, they are all devotes and Vivekananda's and Buddhas. But what about us when I talk to my students? So I always conclude with that poem of Tagore, four liner, which is relevant probably for us here today also. The sun is setting in the western horizon, looks at the world and says, I am now leaving. Who is there now to show the light? The world is silent, in darkness all around. In a far corner, a little lamp lights up. And says, Sir, I will do the best that I can. Kedo ibe mor kattu kahe shundharobi, shuniya jagat kahe nirutto chhumi. Maati pudi chhoshe ko ibe shami, amanti ibe kattu ko ibe thami. Sir, I will do the best that I can. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Mukherjee, for a very interesting and erudite talk based. Uh, on classical texts as well as modern management texts. Uh, I have one query though. Uh, you know, Alexander's okay, invasion, I'll come, I'll come, I'll come. Alexander's invasion doesn't find any mention in any Indian source. Only in Greek source it finds uh, a mention. Which source are you using? I, I, I told you, it yeah. comes in a book called Leading and Consciously from where I read it. And I've uh, he's uh, by the present director of IIM Cozy Court. Uh, the book was published from whatever time in the year 1998. It's from there that I've taken it. Okay. Any, any more for comments and questions? Quick, please. Very quick. Yeah. Shall we come to talk together for the last session tomorrow? <laughs> the time. Wrap, up, wrap up session. Okay. 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 So we conclude this. Yeah. Session. Thank you very much indeed. Time. And Professor R.C. Prasad is the next chair, and the speaker uh, is uh, 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 Professor Indrani Sanya.